In this video, I'm explaining what quadratic voting is, and it's important to understand that there's no such thing as a perfect voting system. In fact, Arrow's impossibility theorem proved that mathematically all voting systems have vulnerabilities and weaknesses of some sort, including this one, but this video really is more about explaining it because it does have some advantages. And the best voting system might depend on the situation. So for example, it could be that we want to use a different voting system when we vote for the president than when we vote for school board funding and how to allocate that funding. So to start explaining this, I'd like you to imagine a situation where a city has a bunch of potential laws that they want their citizens to vote on, and they plan to have one vote per month. We're just gonna keep this simple. Okay, so every citizen in the city is given 12 votes, and they can allocate those votes however they want across the 12 months and 12 potential laws. So they could put all 12 votes on one thing, or they could vote once a month, or they could be lazy and not vote at all. And this is not quadratic voting yet. We haven't gotten there yet, but if we think about this, we're sort of on our way to quadratic voting, and then we can think about what's wrong with this system, what's right with it, and how do we fix it, and that's gonna lead us to quadratic voting. Okay, so first, what are the benefits of the system I've just described? Well, you might notice that people have the ability to sort of budget and set priorities and spend their voting budget according to those priorities. And budgeting has a lot of advantages. In particular, it, it causes people to think carefully about how to allocate those scarce resources, which in this case is their votes, but with money, that's money in a budget. It causes people to sort of weigh the benefit of different votes against each other, to prioritize, to sort of sort through their values and the strength of their values, and that could be really beneficial with voting. Because one of the problems with this sort of one person, one vote on every one of these votes is that some people don't really care that much, they're just voting to have an opinion, and other people care a lot. And yet, in a normal voting system where you get one person, one vote, those people's preferences are weighed equally when maybe they shouldn't be. So the voting system I've just described has this advantage of accounting for the strength of people's preferences and having people vote on the things that they most care about. So then, what's the problem with the voting system I just described? The problem is that people can have too much power in one given vote. So if you save up all of your votes and put all 12 of your votes on the thing that you most care about, you could kind of rule the day. Um, and let's go through a specific example. Imagine there's a committee of 10 people who are voting on this, and imagine that nine of the 10 just have one vote per, per item because they care a little bit about each of these items. One person has a really strong opinion about one of them. Say, for example, it's the owner of a company who doesn't want the carbon tax because the carbon tax proposal would tax his company and stop them from polluting, so he wants to put all of his eggs in the basket of stopping this tax on pollution. If he saves up all of his votes, all 12 votes, he's gonna outvote the other nine people on the committee and carry that vote so it's not really going to be what's best for the community, it's going to be what's best for him. So in that case, we have someone with a little bit too much power by saving up their votes. So this system doesn't quite work because of that. We need something a little bit in between the one vote, one person for each of these and the 12 votes where you can sort of budget them however you want. And quadratic voting is basically a happy medium between those two systems. All right, so what does halfway in between look like? Well, it's basically exactly like I described where you have 12 votes that you can budget across these 12 items. But the votes that actually count are going to be discounted if you contribute more votes. Specifically, the votes that count on any given proposal are going to be the square root of how many votes you contribute. So that sounds weird, let's just go through some examples to think it through. So if you contribute one vote, square root of one is just one, you have one vote in that election. If you save up all 12 of your votes throughout the year and vote all 12 on one thing, that doesn't count as 12 votes in that particular election. It counts as the square root of 12. So that only contributes 3.46 votes. So there is an advantage to saving up votes for 
for the particular proposals you really care about, but your saving up votes is still not going to allow you to sort of dominate that particular election simply because there's this diminishing marginal value of each vote you contribute. So you can see this has some of the advantages of the budgeting system of voting where people have to sort of weigh their values against one another. They do express the strength of their preferences through the votes counted, but because we have this square root feature, it's much harder for people to dominate a given vote just because they've saved up all their votes. So people have to think very strategically about how to allocate those 12. And you can see that it's diminishing at the margin. And you know, economists kind of like things when they diminish at the margin, that's, that's in our wheelhouse. Now, I think it's helpful to go through some specific examples here. So let's imagine a situation where there's three people voting, and this can be three types of people in a community who's voting. We have Amy, who really cares about participating in every vote and sort of maximizing her opinions that she gets to express through the voting process. So Amy's going to spend one vote every month when they vote. Bob really cares about legalizing marijuana, so he's going to save up all of his votes and spend them all the time they vote on marijuana laws. And then Cindy looks at the list and finds that there's three things on there she cares about and the rest she doesn't really care that much about. She cares about the sick leave, the minimum wage, and the library funds. So Cindy's going to allocate four of her 12 votes every time they vote on one of those three things. And here's a sense of how that how those votes would happen. So in most of these votes, Amy's gonna be the one whose opinion carries the day. But Cindy's four votes translate into two votes, square root of four is two, in all three of the elections she votes in. So in those, Cindy's opinion counts twice as much as Amy's, even though she um, is spending a higher share of her budget on those votes, that's just how the square root thing works. And in the one vote that Bob really cares about, the marijuana vote, um, he casts all 12 of his votes, but they only count for 3.46. So if there's four other people in the room and his votes only count for 20% of what's going on, and the other people don't want that law to pass, then he'll be outvoted. So he's never gonna dominate completely, but if he really cares about it, he can have more of a say. Now, the person constructing this voting system can tweak it so that there's different variations. For example, how many votes does a person get per year? Is it 12? Is it 2? How long can you save up for? Can you save up for 10 years so that in 10 years you'll have 120 votes to cast on something you really care about? Now, even if you saved up votes for 10 whole years, that would still only be the square root of 120, and so that's only 11 total votes. But you could allow people to sort of accumulate votes over the years to only vote when they really, really care about something. But of course then you could have people who are just apathetic they're just not interested in voting and those people are gonna have an outsized say in elections when they do vote. Now, there's also the issue of the agenda. Like, do you set the agenda for all 12 months ahead of time so people know what they want to save up for? Or do you leave room for votes that we don't really expect? And that's gonna make it harder for people to think about how to allocate their votes because they don't know if there's going to be a vote on abortion or a vote on gun control. They don't know these votes that they might care a lot about, so maybe they're not gonna vote much because something they care more about could come up. And that's gonna make it harder for voters to make these decisions. But it's also probably realistic that we don't always know what we're going to need to vote on, so there almost always will be some kind of uncertainty. Particularly if you have a longer time span over which these votes count. Now, you could have no time span. For example, you could have this entire system done once a year in one evening where everything that was sort of on the agenda for voting that, that particular year shows up on the agenda and everyone has a clear picture of what they're voting on. That removes the uncertainty, it removes the time span, it removes some of the effort, assuming that it's at least a little bit effortful to vote. So basically, there's just a lot of variations on how you could actually construct a quadratic voting situation. Now, the voting system isn't perfect. For example, it requires an identity. So um, the way it's constructed, you kind of need to know this person's vote counts less if it's one person casting 10 votes today. 
That requires you knowing who cast these votes and you need an identity for that. So if we're imagining an online situation where people are voting on a forum, the question is, could someone just create a bunch of fake accounts and vote through those fake accounts and get around this whole um, quadratic voting system? Yeah, that's possible. That's certainly possible. And you could also, of course, have bribing in this situation as you do in many other types of voting situations. I guess the question is, do the social norms actually allow for that? And social norms are enforced socially, not mechanically, so that can be hard to control for, but there's clever ways that different people can control for those. So basically, it's not a perfect voting system, but it's an interesting voting system. It, it gets around some of the problems of other voting systems, and I do expect it'll be something that we see used more often as the online environment becomes more complicated. I think there will be more online communities that want to self-govern and we're going to need good mechanisms for self-governing those communities and I think quadratic voting offers an interesting option that gets around some of the problems that other voting systems have so I expect it'll be used in multiple contexts in the years to come.